Hi, this is Pat Moorhead and the 6.5 is live at MongoDB Local here in New York City 2023. And as you can hear around us, there's a lot going on. I mean, five simultaneous stages going on. Developer, 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 amazing product launches, great technology. Daniel, are you having fun? I'm having fun. Anytime you put growth, technology, developers, um, AI, AI, AI. <laughs> I was going to try to come up with something else. All right, okay. But that's what everybody wants to talk about, Dan. No, it's great being here in New York yeah. City. This is a, a great venue. It's got a little bit of that kind of cool, open startup vibe, and it's also creating a lot of a lot of sound or a lot of a lot of ambience around us. But but truly, you don't need that because the ambience. You can see people are excited. People are pumped up. MongoDB had a lot to say today. It had announcements. It had a growth story. They what? did, and the big purveyor of all that goodness on stage was, of course, Dave, but you as Chief Product Officer. So here, welcome to the 6.5. I am happy to be here. Thanks for making the time, guys. Absolutely. It is great to have you here. You know, you made a lot of announcements today. Kind of some unveils, some... Six press releases. <laughs> some press. You know, you're only review. doing, you're only doing yeah. 30 of these in 19 countries. Yeah. Yeah. Can you do six announcements at each one? <laughs> that would make a product guy. We try to guy. bundle as many as we can <laughs> that around That would this. make a product then, guy uh, cry real tears. Then we, um, um, but we have some other surprises throughout the rest of the year. Ooh. So, yeah. well, the nice thing about you know, software is you can move a little faster. You know, yeah. It doesn't happen quite as fast on the hardware front, but in the database space with Gen AI and yep. AI and everything and the expectation that yes. MongoDB is going to have a story, there's a lot going on there. You made a bunch of announcements around mm -hmm. Atlas. Atlas Search was mm -hmm. one of the things that really caught my yeah. attention. I know it's not brand new. You've been rolling this yes. out for some time and the adoption's been fast, the customer demand's been fast. Yep. Talk a little bit about that kind of evolution of Atlas Search and maybe is this sort of Gen AI moment creating a real accelerator for what was already doing quite well? Sure, yeah, happy to get into it. So Atlas Search is a great example of a capability in the platform that's very customer driven. You know, we were in so many customers as their core operational database, and a lot of them were coming to us and frankly saying, why do I have to stand up a separate search database side by side and then manage all this data pipelines that fall, you know, fall over half the time and the data is hard to keep in sync. And so they said, you know, for the application use cases of search in particular, this seems like a problem Mongo should be solving. And so that's really uh, what drove us to it a few years ago. So we started working on an incubation project internally. You know, we identified what kind of indexing technology we wanted to use, you know, and really had to build from the ground up an extension to the engine that would make the developer feel like they're just using this single database, but have the capability of collapsing really two databases into one, as well as getting rid of the need to manage all that synchronization tasks. And you know, as always with our business, we tend to see innovative, fast-moving startups. Perhaps they're getting started on our self-service channel or developers prototyping. That's kind of the, the early stage of adoption. I'll say in the last year, year and a half, we've really started to see mission-critical production enterprise workloads start to come to the platform because the cost of managing different environments, and not just direct costs of the infrastructure or the licenses or whatnot, but the distraction on people to operate secure and develop against a fragmented system is something that you know, architects, CIOs, CTOs, and executives are starting to pay more attention to, and that's really started to drive, I'd say, larger workloads on the platform, which then leads to some of the announcements, right? So you can see some of the announcements on search this year are about maturity. It's about how do we give more flexibility to scale the search environment. It's giving insights into how search is being used so that you can build a smarter search experience. So it's, it's kind of that second phase of product evolution that we're focused on. Yeah, I really like your commentary on simplification. And you know, if I look at IT over the last 30 years uh, as, as I've been in here, you know, it's kind of an accordion, right? Where, hey, best of breed, best of breed, yeah. best of breed, and IT's like, man, we got too many best of breeds. We need the cost of integration yeah. uh, is outweighing the benefits uh, of having that. But I wanted to drill down on Atlas Search, a specific type of search, vector search. Yeah. Can you talk about why you brought that out specifically and maybe the incremental value that it's bringing to your customers? And I, I heard a little bit of uh, LLM uh, attachment in there too for vector. Yeah, it's interesting. We actually started working on vector search almost a year and a half, two years ago. 
And this was before the whole generative AI boom started, you know, six or eight cool. weeks. Because our search customers were saying, okay, you know, these models are being democratized and we need more than just relevance or keyword based search rankings on text. Right. We want to be able to index other types of information, so images, video, audio, et cetera. Add that in, so that's being one driver. And secondarily, they wanted to be able to have a system that can use models to match things that are alike as opposed to having to just, you know, have the descriptions or the metadata on the system and, or the raw text. And so we started to hear those requirements. We saw that sort of semantic search use case, I think that Dave articulated in his, his keynote, in because of Atlas Search. And that's what led us to say, okay, there's actually a second product opportunity here, but it really almost has two flavors of use cases. There's ones that are a expansion of Atlas search into this hybrid search model where you have a combination of relevance or keyword based search and vector search that can broaden the types of data and, the, and the, do similarity search alongside keyword search. But then there's this new gen AI boom which is driving use cases, especially recently, which is really saying you can use vectorization to augment these big foundational models like OpenAI, et cetera, to, with proprietary data. So you can get you know, a company's unique information, domain specific information, to either make those LLMs more accurate by constraining them to a new ground truth, or add proprietary data that they didn't, weren't ever trained on in the public sphere to be able to answer against Which that as well. Which is really the holy grail for enterprises. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I think it's become overwhelmingly obvious that the table stakes of open AI, of all of them, yeah. I mean even Microsoft and Google have allegedly come out and said like, you know, the real, the real yeah. beauty is when you have that proprietary data. And by the way, that example you gave, the automotive one with yeah. the sounds and then yeah. being able to take yeah. those manual, I'm like, God, that's brilliant. Yeah, well, that's what a real world example we were lucky enough to get started and working with. So when I heard it for the first time myself, I was like, that is pretty cool. Because <laughs> the kind of data that is, I mean, that's yeah. a very unique kind yeah. of data and you know, using vector to kind of connect these different exactly. data archetypes and then make it really seamless on the, in the application, yep. super powerful. Another thing that you talked about with Atlas is stream processing. Now, when you say stream pro processing and, and you talk about it, the immediate thing that comes to everyone's mind is Kafka. Yeah. Talk a little bit about you know, the approach, you know, what, you're, what you're doing with stream processing, where you see that going. Yeah, absolutely. And we've been working with Confluent on integrations to Kafka for years. You know, we have a native connector that we work on with them that integrates Atlas to Confluent Cloud, also works with self-managed offering. There's a lot of news in that in the market today. But what we realized is for application developers who want to power the application experience, we needed a real stream processing engine. And our developer community is used to working in a very natural language, uh, like idiomatic way of working with data. They don't want to deal with SQL for streaming and then MQL and documents for data. So it really, they pulled us to expand our query engine to be able to process the data that's sitting in Kafka or other streaming systems across the enterprise. So it's a very complementary extension to be able to say, you have this, this plumbing, this transport, flowing data across your enterprise. If you want to power an application experience, now a developer can extend and integrate data at rest in the database with data in motion in a singular experience that powers that live application. And that, you know, that's yes. pervasive in any type of use case across many verticals, you know, fraud detection and financial services. Um, you know, I've used an energy grid example, or there's live energy sensor grids and reactive maintenance use cases. There's plenty of examples of how this is broadly applicable. And so we're excited to see, obviously, how, how the adoption goes as we've made it public this, this week. Yeah, I really have enjoyed over the past couple of years how you've been adding different capabilities to your, I'm a, I'm a visual learner, so I love the uh, architecture diagram uh, that shows. Team, no, no I, I mean, <laughs> it, it's how my brain works, yeah. fortunately or unfortunately, yeah. but it's been fascinating to see how you keep adding capabilities, but it's still the one, one API model yeah. uh, document based, yes. which is yeah. very consistent and consistency is good. Yeah, and that's the North Star for us because we're not trying to have the longest list of features or services in just in, under one brand or one bill. Yeah. Like the way we compete and the why developers love us is the intuitiveness of how easy it is to work with MongoDB and therefore do their jobs easily, more faster, more efficiently. And so we only go after areas that serve developers, 
that can power those modern application experiences, and we think we have a right to really differentiate because of documents and that API as our integration point. Uh, one, uh, one thing I want to dig into, we haven't talked about yet, is, is analytics. And most people, when they think of analytics, it's more batch mode, right? I have a question I need, or, or maybe it's batched up every week, right? And this is the analysis that I get. I get pretty pictures that Pat likes, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, up front, uh, maybe it's a spreadsheet. But real-time analytics uh, embedded into applications looks like a very hot opportunity. It's, it's, it's hard, though. It's not easy to do, because that little time frame thing, right? Because you can't wait for your customer to give them uh, what they want. I'm curious, what kind of use cases are you looking at with your customers for embedding real-time analytics into applications? Yeah, that's uh, an area, I, last year we made a lot of new announcements and we've obviously been iterating throughout the year. So analytics for us at a very macro level, what we're paying attention to is over time, software automates a lot of manual business processes or human you know, reasoning. You know, we saw this with operations moving to DevOps where code automates operations. You're seeing the same thing happen with DevSecOps where now security is being automated in software by development teams from the get-go of the process. And we think there's a portion of analytics that's not going to be you know, an executive looking at a dashboard saying, go do this, right. it's going to be software that's getting a real-time view of what's happening, processing that, and leveraging yes. rules and logic and models to do something off of that. That's not to say the batch systems go away, but that's the exciting stuff for us is in the in-app use cases that yes. you're alluding to. Now, there are a lot of requirements that puts on a system, so we have to invest heavily in new indexing types, our query engine, performance, I mentioned, a lot of the uh, performance enhancements in 7.0 and Mongo are aimed at these, what you would call in-app or real-time use cases. And what's interesting is the end user of that, or the end um, developer, a uh, uh, person building these, is the developer. It's not a business analyst writing SQL queries to power a dashboard, it's a developer writing code. And so that's where we think we have a really compelling story for all the reasons we've talked about. Idiomatic approach to drivers, this amazing developer community that we're surrounded with. And so we've been we're focused on that really first with the database itself. And we've been used for things like customer 360, taking a bunch of sources of information about a customer. For example, um, MetLife is a longtime MongoDB user. They take real-time information from different systems of record that power different insurance lines and different businesses. They pull it together continuously into an ODS layer on Mongo so that their agents can get a real-time view of all the policies across the life cycle of engaging with the brand that they have access to. Yeah. Uh, we work on logistics management. We work with the train operator in the UK. They take information about real-time train routing, where there's congestion. They built software that then makes intelligent decisions on where to slow down and route trains in an automated way, where there's human oversight, but it's no longer a human having to decide, okay, that, that train's behind, I got to go slow it down, or slow it down, I can let another one by. It, they've automated that process. Yes. To us, these are all query patterns that are analytical in nature, but applied to the use cases of, of applications. And stream processing just takes that further. Yeah. Because now you don't have to necessarily persist all that data in a database before you can start to run these types of queries. You can run windows and functions <laughs> right on top of the data as it's being collected in a stream in motion. Powerful. Yeah, the tendency yeah. definitely is heading towards everything being real time when possible. I know, yeah. I know that batch will still make sense, but the direction of compute, the direction of software, of networking, is all about making the data move faster, being brought, and obviously you got to have that software layer um, on, on top of it. So we only got a, a minute left, but I, I, I would be missing an opportunity to talk about security. One of the things that you did talk about that I thought was really important was, you know, dealing with the data in use. Meaning, you know, you talked about data at rest and emotion, something I think most companies have figured out how to secure, but that data in use is a problem and you brought a solution to light today. This is an exciting space for us and we've been, you know, we've been working on security in various different ways for a long time, but encryption in particular is interesting, especially in a cloud context, because there's a trust factor, shared trust model between you as a customer and your provider, and your provider could be a database provider like MongoDB that's operating and scaling your database to the cloud. It could be a major hyperscaler that's running the underlying infrastructure. So it's a real shared trust model. And so for extremely sensitive data, customers are very hesitant to potentially take the most sensitive data in a 
trust model where there are third parties involved. So in 2019, we released a feature called client-side field-level encryption, which allows the data to be encrypted before it ever gets to the cloud service or to the database, in our case, a database vendor or the cloud providers we partner with. And so that way, if you ever need to make sure that no, there's no data exfiltration, data leakage, you can be sure that the only entity with access to the key is your organization. And that helps with things like GDPR and the right to forget. If a, if a customer calls and says, you know, I want my information deleted, you don't have to go trace all the backups that who knows across where they might sit, you just delete the key. Really powerful. But the limitation with that approach, like every other database that's implemented client-side encryption, is the only types of queries you can run are exact matches. So just a point query on a single record. So I really have to be specific on what you're looking for. The ability to aggregate or, or find things based on filters and searches has been impossible. And so we got in touch around that time frame with the team from Brown University that was writing some really interesting research around, it's called structured encryption. They started a company called the Roki Systems or Roki Labs. We acquired the team and the founders and the early technology. And for two years, we've been saying, how do we take this structured encryption and apply it to an operational database? And that's what's been in preview for the last uh, few quarters. We're announcing the GA and MongoDB 7.0 and it really changes the game because it allows that same value proposition, a single key that you control that none of your providers or any third parties can access. The data is encrypted while it's in memory in the database server, but yet you can start to run queries that are searching multiple records and filters as well. So it's an industry first, there's some real heavy R&D that went into this one. It's early on this journey, we have great plans for the future, but we're really excited about where this can go, take our industry. Yeah, I mean, as I hear you talking about this yeah. encryption capability, it yeah. sounded like a little bit of magic, right? <laughs> the, the magic is real, and quite yeah. frankly, that is many of the and tricks uh, that people yeah. bring, is you're bringing magic to core yeah. developers, and they appreciate it. Yeah, and you don't need to be a cryptology expert to leverage this. It's all very accessible for any developer. The, uh, it's worth noting, all of the math and the research behind this is third-party validated, open, so it's trusted, you know, this is not proprietary. We want the world to see how this is done so they can trust it and know that it's real. So here, I want to thank yeah. you so much for thank joining you, us here on the 6.5. Great conversation. I think we cool. covered it all. I think we, yeah. we got through all the announcements, we more did that, or less. I have no idea. <laughs> um, we, and we didn't cover was uh, the financial yeah. uh, part, but we talked about uh, that with your financial, financial customers. Oh, all right, that's even I better. Mean, and Citibank, yeah. Wells Fargo. Yeah, they were both here. Yeah. They were both yeah. here, and in fairness, basically what yeah. you're building is all that stuff with a, with, a, with, with a financial uh, lens on it. Exactly. So, so here, thanks so much for joining thank us here on the 6.5. Thank you, really appreciate the time. All right, you heard it here. This was a great run through of all of the announcements here today at MongoDB Local in New York City. It is 30 of these events, 19 different countries, but this was a big one, six different announcements. And we've been here all day talking to the executives of MongoDB, the customers, and some of the big SIs. And if you liked what you heard here, hit that subscribe button, check out all our other episodes. But for Patrick and myself, we got to say goodbye for this one. We'll see you all really soon.